It's World AIDS Day. So we have questions um, from lots of people across the Prime Global Network. Uh, back in 2013-2014, the FDA, um, FPO, etc., was starting to put forward the concept of patient-focused medicine development. PFMD has its own acronym. When I say that to you, as a clinician and someone who um, you know, runs a lot of clinical trials, what does that term mean to you? Does it mean anything to you? Or is it just something that's a little bit hackneyed so that the regulators are appearing more patient-centred? What, what does PFMD mean? So going back to when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry in the early 90s, on, uh, involved in the development of some of the second and third generations of drugs, we were already including surveys from patients that examine their quality of life during the course of, of the study. And they'd be often quite long surveys. The MOS 30 was one of the ones that was used at the time in our field. Um, so it was 30 different questions that looked at in multiple angles at, at the patient experience and the quality of life that they have. And as the years have gone by in our area, we've become very focused on the customer experience because we're dealing with people who are going to be infected, we anticipate, for their, their whole life, that they're going to be taking medication for their whole life, and that therefore we want to make that experience as good as possible. So again, when we started seeing the first once a day medications and the first single tablet reg regimens, um, we worked with a, a group at University College, led by Professor Rob Horn there, who looked at uh, aspects around the intrusiveness of medication into daily life, to again look at the ways in which the patient was experiencing with the niceness of taking one pill versus having three bottles to open or three bottles to mm. carry with them when they were travelling somewhere. Um, and, and the risk of partial adherence that came from um, having multiple uh, pills to take. So now we're moving into the injectable era and we're also thinking about how we can get the most out of those uh, injectable medications and so we ask a lot about uh, patient related outcomes in terms of the experience they have within the clinical trials mm -hmm. of receiving an injectable rather than receiving a tablet because they're people who have been started on tablets and then have gone on to injectables subsequently in a, in a randomized way and then after those products have been become available we're also looking at the experience of how they are delivered mm -hmm. to make sure that the experience of delivering that injectable treatment is uh, minimally intrusive into that person's life so they really benefit from being liberated from the tablet yeah. and being able to have an injectable treatment. Yeah. So it's interesting because we we hear within our little patient engagement sphere about the problems, the patient reported outcome measures and the patient reported experience measures. So it's quite easy for, for us um, within pharma because we've been part of the patient focused best development group and movement for you know coming up to a decade. But I think it's only just now starting to become routine that a prom or a prem is considered as a, a, a part of a clinical trial. And at the moment, you know, if you look on, on the NICE um, website, they are now starting to list very clearly. Uh, you can actually search for PROMs in an area, or PREM in an area. So do you think it's going to become more routine in um, clinical trials for HIV treatments? Do you think that there's going to be a, where's the PROM, where's the PREM? You know, sec primary outcome, secondary outcome, where's the PROM, where's the PREM? Do you think that might be the way? I think very likely because the newer medications that are coming along for HIV are having to compete with a lot of great products that are now becoming generic and much cheaper. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you want to pay for something that's more expensive, you've got to be giving the, the end user of that product something that says there is an advantage to this. If we go back in time with people with HIV to the early days of social media, often many of the side effects that have occurred with HIV medications were identified in a post-marketing period and they were ident identified by people talking to each other about their experience of being on drugs and were able to pick up things that were missed, perhaps because they were, were initially quite subtle mm. within clinical trials, but then 
impacted those individuals much more than we expected to, um, or they, they were new things that had not been described. So we've got a long history of HIV, of the community talking about their experience of medication, and both good and bad, and helping us identify the unmet needs or problems that may be arising with medication, and potentially having the opportunity to, to nip those in the bud. Yeah, it is becoming a signalling service, those social media channels. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, pharma have notoriously been terrified of using social media channels to educate, engage or reach out to patients. But that's not the case anymore. They're becoming more and more aware that these are very useful channels um, to engage with patients, find out why they're dropping out of trials, encourage them to be in trials, educate them about the trials. So I think we're going to have a new era now of uh, proper, beyond gossip, but actual medical use of these channels um, to support clinical trial um, and patient-focused medicine development. Yeah, I think in working those things, it's always important to have moderated discussions because sometimes you do get um, misinformed or misinforming individuals who participate in those forums, and that's been often the problem that farmers have encountered in the past, is that they've encountered the hostility towards farming that has resulted in the forum not being as helpful. And I think one of the things that we've seen in the uh, COVID era is both that there is a group of people who are um, determined to misinform the population, but we've also had a, a golden age for public relations for pharmaceutical companies where people have seen how multiple pharmaceutical companies have invested billions of dollars to very rapidly bring to market absolutely extraordinary pieces of science that are life-saving and, and life-changing in this epidemic. So it, it's a great opportunity for pharma to engage with the community much more.